Let's just talk about the DUP. Now, obviously, the, the, the big line is that the DUP, 10 MPs, are able to affect a whole government and, indeed, a national Brexit negotiation strategy. Just what are your thoughts on that? Are they too powerful? Well, I think it's an absurd situation where you can have a very small and really quite extremist party controlling the British government. And, you know, we were told that we'd be taking back control. Actually, it's 10 DUP MPs who appear to be taking back control. And we have to remember that, actually, they don't have a majority of support in Northern Ireland, and actually Northern Ireland voted to remain, so they're not representative at all. And I think what happened on Monday is that a deal was done that was a kind of Euro fudge to get us into the next phase of negotiation. So we had enough of a settlement on the money, the citizens' rights had made good progress, and as far as the Irish border's concerned, they said, well, you know, we can't really finalise that until we know what the future trade relationship's going to be. So we'll just move along into the next phase, which is what the British government has desperately wanted to happen. But unfortunately, this little ambiguous form of words got out and it frightened the horses and the DUP part of Northern Ireland, and then the whole thing blew apart. So it's another appalling Brexit mess, I'm afraid. And in terms of, you know, sufficient progress is the key word to be using at the moment, in, particularly in context of next week. Do you think it's going to be achieved before Christmas? Likely? Well, look, we have to remember that the sufficient progress kind of mantra was established by the EU side. It was a, a sequencing arrangement that David Davis said he would fight tooth and nail and then immediately caved in on. And, you know, if the politics of this, uh, this side, on the EU side, means that it's better to move into trade talks, then I'm sure a way will be found. And my view is that the EU is now desperately keen to, to know what's going to happen, because we've only got a year, less than a year now, before we have to agree this, and they don't want to cliff-edge Brexit, because that will be destructive here as well. Mentioning David Davis, obviously the Brexit Secretary, now he's, this morning, said that there are no such thing as these Brexit assessments about what the impact could be, where the weak spots are in terms of the UK economy and fragility, in terms of uh, a hard Brexit or whatever kind of Brexit that we're going to go for. Now, talk to me about your legal case and where it is at the moment. Well, basically, just to go back to what David Davis was saying this morning in Parliament, I mean, he's told Parliament previously that these studies exist in excruciating detail, so detailed that he's only read executive summaries, and uh, now we hear suddenly they never existed at all. So these studies that he, we've all been talking about for months have suddenly disappeared in a puff of smoke. And my view is that is really showing contempt for the House, and I don't see how he can continue in his job having, you know, basically one way or another lied to Parliament. Do they exist? Um, my view is that they do exist. They may not all be in Dexu. Some of them may be in the Treasury. I mean, there's two ways of looking at it. Either they don't exist, in which case it's utter incompetence and dereliction of duty by David Davis, or they do exist, in which case he's lied to us. But to move on to the legal case, there's a lovely sort of scalpel there which can clean out the, uh, the confusion and just give clarity, because David Davis is not capable, I believe, of putting a witness statement into the court, which is deceitful. And if he did that and he was found to be lying, he would end up in jail. So there's some real clarity coming with the legal case, I hope. And so what, what's the sort of timeline we're looking at in terms of this? So you've been in contact with Dexu regarding yes. this legal case, yes. and they've, I assume, responded to you? So we, we're looking for two things. We're looking for the, the famous 58 kind of five go to Dorset Brexit secret studies, but we're also looking for a Treasury report which they refuse to tell us whether it even exists, but people have speculated about it. So there are those two um, sources of data about what, what your future is after Brexit, effectively. And um, we've sent our letter before action, which means we're telling them we're serious about the judicial review. They replied, you know, with a big, we've got a big scary lawyer, we're not, uh, not going to release these documents. And so now we have to launch our legal action, which should happen hopefully tomorrow. We have to get our documentation together. And from there, from tomorrow, what's the sort of timeline? So it's quite difficult to say. Obviously, we have asked for expedition. That's a loyally word. That means we've asked them to give us a, an early hearing because of the public importance and public interest in this case. But I think the most optimistic would be that we will get a result by February. So, you know, it's another path, basically. There's the political shenanigans at Westminster. We'll see how far that goes. We'll see what sort of pressure that uh, the DEXU committee and Keir Starmer and Hillary Benn can put Davis under there. But also it's important to follow this legal route because there is no way that the government will be able to resist that if the case comes out in our favour. And in terms of the notion that these assessment reports, if they exist, to publish them in full would undermine the Brexit negotiations in the, in, for the UK because it would reveal to the world, including the European Union, where the sensitivities would be 
for the UK and the UK economy and the UK, you know, uh, the relationship with the EU so far would be. Do you buy that? Is that a fair point? Abs it... Absolutely not. I mean, I believe that the studies do exist. I believe that the civil service would certainly have carried out, carried out these sort of impact assessments. The reason the government is hiding them is because they show the very negative impacts that we already know. So will that undermine our negotiating position? Well, only in as much as we're well, already they undermining it. Specific. There will be very specific details but, about the, you know, what what they really don't want to happen, what really can't happen. But in a, terms of a lot of people have already carried out impact assessments. Private companies, obviously at the EU side, they've published all the impact but studies. Surely not without this kind of information and data that the UK government would have. have well, at the, the, the point is about what the UK government has is that it's informing the um, actions taken by our representatives. So it's democratically necessary that we know that because otherwise you can have Sajid Javid coming out and saying this is all going to be brilliant for business and you can have Chris Grayling saying you know the farmers can grow more food people can make all these airy claims waving their arms around but behind the scenes they have real data telling them whether those claims are true we need to know whether those claims are true this is the biggest decision that Britain's taken for 40 years if as I believe the impact studies show that it's actually going to be very economically damaging then we have a right as the British people to say actually that's not what we voted for and that's not what we want.